So, um, I work as a futurist. Many of you may wonder what a futurist is. Uh, I wonder about that myself sometimes. Uh, a futurist is not somebody that's going to predict what happens. I mean, that's obviously not possible. Right? But what we do is we specialize in foresights, right? which, be, which means that we help people understand what's coming and bring that forward. So usually at the next three to five year level, uh, usually people who run businesses have a very hard time looking beyond what's coming next week or next month because they're operational. Right? And so what we do is we try to bring stuff that's quite obvious, but most people don't have time to look at. When, while I was listening to the last speaker, I was thinking of the whole time, basically, I think this concept of selling things in, in channels, multi-channel selling, has, has a big flaw, of course, and in, in the flaw is the channel itself, right? I mean, we're not living our lives in channels. Right? Uh, this is sort of a, uh, a way of looking at, at selling at some sort of uh, mousetrap. Uh, so we devise better mouse traps when we have better channels. You know, I think the basic thing that's happening now in a networked society and in a digital world is that we are actually getting away from this idea of being trapped in something. Uh, this is a very big issue, I think, if you look across business, and I, I did a lot of work in media in the past, um, is that uh, the issue of control was a huge issue. How, how do you control what people are doing? where they are going, what they're buying, what they are able to buy, and so on, right? And on the internet, it's basically, if you're looking at, uh, you know, mobile devices, not necessarily the iPhone, but, you know, this is a device of uncontrol. And right? it, gives, it gives the control to the other party. Right? So I worked in the music business for a long time as a producer, but also later on as, as helping them to understand the web. Uh, this device, of course, puts the fear of God into media companies, right? Because basically, the consumer gets all the power here, right? You can go in the store, scan the barcode, compare the price, right? I mean, that is basically, you know, for, for people running the store, that's not good news. Right? You can go online, download anything you want, any movie, any, any, you can listen to anything you want and watch anything you want on YouTube for free. So why do you need cable TV? Right? I mean, in the end, it's, it's rapid consumer empowerment. So that's a very big issue, a huge opportunity. Right, but we have to get away from this idea of saying that we're going to control what the user does or, the, or my business partners do, right? It's much more about trust. When you're running your companies on a daily basis, to free up your staff to spend 5% of their time on this job. Right? Because the problem is if we don't develop foresights, we're always behind. And now the speed of the web, you know, the, the speed of development is, is so dramatically quicker. Now, I used to work a lot for car companies uh, and they made a new car every five years and then I made a new car every three years and our development cycle is 14 months. I mean the speed of development if we don't have foresight is going to be impossible to do. Uh, and by the way, if, you are, if you're on Twitter, here's my Twitter handle, G. Leonhardt. Okay? Uh, if you haven't tried Twitter, you should. I'll explain later why that is a very good exercise in understanding what's happening. Uh, these are some of my clients that you can see here. So we work with hundreds of companies, essentially all in sort of technology, communications, and, and media. So this is an interesting slide I, I uh, want to share with you because it kind of shares the kind of world that we're in now. Right? This world is A, noisy. Right? It's chaotic. It has many opinions. It has all things happening at the same time. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, which was one of the original futurists in media, he said, 1971, the global village, right? I mean, this, this is what we have now. And the global village is not a place of peace, harmony, and quiet, right? It's not. I mean, clearly, when we have five billion people connected to the Internet, we're going to disagree on a lot of things. There's going to be lots of debate and lots of questions, right? I mean, it can't obviously be in a connected system you have more discussions, right? So we have an interconnected world, right, what I call the network society. And uh, um, Ray Kurzweil, who is the uh, founder of the Singularity Movement in, in the US, he says a kid in Africa with a smartphone has more information than the President of the United States 15 years ago. Now think about this five years from now. Right? A person with a smartphone is going to have not just the information, right, but will have the comparison of all your offerings, will have your track record will look at 
uh, what you stand for, what mistakes you've made, the entire history of what you do is and will be available. Education, I don't know if you're in the education business, but basically you can learn anything you want in five years by going to an online place where you can study and, and get an MBA or something like an MBA. You can already do that, right? But it's going to actually work then. So think about what that will do to a lot of our society and the changes that we're going to see there. We're now living in this world, and many of us, you know, I'm 50 years old, and for many of us this is actually a pretty hard development, because we don't like to be part of a link system, right? We like to be the link in the middle, right? We like to be the link where people come to, right? Because we're experts and authorities and so on and so on. Right? So if you're looking at telcos, uh, telecom companies, or ISPs and operators, or media companies, right? They're not operating like this. Right? They are the big link in the middle. If you are the big link in the middle, you're in deep trouble, right? Because basically what happens now is that everybody's looking to decentralize. So now you have to have a dual strategy. You have to be powerful and the, and the person in the middle, but you also have to develop this, which is a networked business scenario. And that's actually quite difficult to do. So looking at the issue of you know, multi-channel retailing and selling, you know, I think we need to look a, bit, a little bit deeper. Okay? I don't think it will do a whole lot to look at marginal improvements, how we can be a little bit faster or better with this. Right? Because clearly the, the things are going to move so quickly that we need to think a little bit beyond this. And Marshall McLuhan, as I was saying earlier, he mentioned basically a key word, and that is the world of the global village. Right? The global village is not a place to where you would go and you would say always to people, buy, 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 now you can buy, click here. Right? I mean, this message is, is not really a communal message, right? It's a, it's a commercial message. So what do you do about this? I mean, how do you think about this? And Marshall McLuhan says, it's the framework that changes, not the picture. Okay. So if you're going to look at, at the mobile phone, at social media, at video, at location-based services, as better mousetraps, you know, uh, as better way to sell cheaper, right? then you're looking essentially at the frame. You're looking at the picture, but not at the overall framework. You have to look at the framework. So that's something to think about you know, while, I, while I speak, is that you know, if you're looking at a world like this to where people are going to use uh, mobile phones to scan things, like using a quick response code, you, know, you've, you may have seen this commercial, uh, you know, it dramatically changes the social behavior of people when this is available. Right? So, I mean, it's obviously kind of strange to do this, you know, uh, for a lot of people because it's not really that well integrated yet. But, for example, in Japan, when you go to a date, you can go to a bar uh, where you can scan the face of the uh, person that you're talking to and the software will recognize who it is, right, and will essentially make you, let you make a social connection. You can find out the profile superimposed over the mobile phone while you're talking, right? So you can see this person likes dogs, you don't like dogs, so you don't keep talking, you don't want a girlfriend with a likes dogs. You, you move on to the next person. So it's completely transparent, which is a really strange experience. I tried it myself. So um, Anyway, um, Henry Jenkins, who's a professor at MIT, says something very important. It's really not about the technology, it's about emerging cultural practices. What do people do? And how do they do it? It's not about the fact that we have a mobile phone, it's about what we actually do with it. Many of you may be using uh, TripAdvisor. Anybody you know TripAdvisor, yeah? Anybody? Yeah, okay. Of course, LinkedIn and those kind of things we know, right? But TripAdvisor, for example, is a, is a great example of the habit change. So, for example, in Germany, when I go to a restaurant and I, I put my iPhone on the table and I pull up the TripAdvisor app and I just put it on the table, okay? In many places that I go to, they see that I have TripAdvisor loaded and on the table. Right? I will get better service because they know that the moment something goes wrong, I'll just go like this and I'll say, TripAdvisor, really bad service. Right? They know that I have the power to, to rate them. Right? In America, almost every single doctor is now rated by a website called RateMDs.com, right? where you can go in and say, OK, this, you know, this didn't get the right help and so on. Is that good or is it bad? I don't know. Sometimes it's actually bad because, you know, I may be wrong. You know, TripAdvisor could be wrong. Right? But just two days ago, the, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica went out of print and said, we're no longer going to publish the Britannica. You guys may know, know the Britannica, which was at one point the number one resource for 
colleges where you can look up stuff, right? So Wikipedia came along, and, and uh, now there have been many tests about this, right? So basically the reality is that Wikipedia is pretty much as accurate as the Botanica, right? But of course it's online and it's free, right? And it's made by people who, for whatever reason, contribute to it. Right? So now the Botanica has stopped printing. And guess what the CEO of the Botanica said when he announced that they're going to stop printing, right? He announced that he believes still that the Britannica is infinitely more accurate than Wikipedia, and he doesn't understand why people aren't buying it anymore. Right? That's what he said. Right. So, you know, that's an interesting angle. I think we need to think beyond this sort of obvious uh, scenario of what people are actually going to do in cultural practices. Uh, so I pulled up a few numbers here from Poland. You may, of course, know this better than I do. I'm not an expert on Poland. But uh, in terms of the share of online sales in Poland, it's only 3%. But as the number goes below, goes below it has grown a lot in the last few years. Right? It's not up to the numbers of Switzerland or Germany, which is 9% or UK, 12%. Right? So it's fairly low. I think you're in an extreme period of growth. I mean, that's partly why you're here, I'm sure, that this is finally happening, right? The growth is happening. If you see what's happening with advertising, that's growing a lot, if you believe those numbers. The businesses that are using online uh, e-commerce, you know, finance, telecoms, automotive, clearly that's an interesting stat there. In terms of top 10 countries, this is from 2009, this is kind of old formation, but it's, you know, Poland has a way to go in terms of internet connectivity. This is just now happening, I understand, with LTE and, and companies pushing mobile connectivity. Right. Um, so for a while, of course, for quite some time, Poland has been below the EU average in connectivity. Right? And I think this is something that I think would be one of the first concerns if I was to think about the future there. Uh, in many ways, of course, the telcos and ISPs and operators could be your best friends in, in creating more connectivity so you can reach people better. Right? I mean, if you see what happened in America is that, that uh, uh, Amazon sells more books on the Kindle than in print. And I think about the benefit of that, not just for the trees, but also for Amazon and for the other retailer, retailers, right? So connectivity leads to that sort of progress. That's why I think governments have to be aware that, of all these things, right? The CEO of Woolworth said just a few weeks ago, um, he said basically that the entire business, Woolworth is the biggest retailer in the world, I think, pretty much, uh, will be multi-optional, multi-platform, multi-channel by 2015 and 100% of turnover will emanate from, it, from the multi-option channel. So, so basically multi-option, multi-channel retail becomes the standard. And I, I think that's something that we can easily imagine what that would look like. So um, if you're looking at this stat here uh, about social networking, you, you can see uh, that social networking here in Poland is actually quite popular. It's in the middle there. Many, many of you are on Facebook and, and of course, LinkedIn and so on. And is that in the end, social networking may become the reason for commerce. And this is an interesting angle, is that we thought of social networking as a bunch of kids exchanging dates or recipes for cooking or whatever. Right? But now social networking is becoming a major driver of business. I mean, when Facebook goes public this year, this will be the biggest IPO probably in the last 20 years fetching an estimated hundred billion dollars. Okay. They have one billion users, which is more than any broadcaster, any, any TV station, any network in the world. Right? It's the second largest country in the world. China, only China is bigger. Okay. And Facebook could very easily get to two billion users, which is one third right now of the global population in a year or so. And they have the best possible data about us which is a scary thought, right? I mean, they have more data about us than the FBI. So there you can see basically social networking becomes a major driver of commerce because clearly, A, they have the data. Right? They know a lot. We give them lots of data. We kind of trust them, at least for the most part, right? And this is why Amazon is getting into social networking, right? So you can use Amazon to exchange social information. For example, the books that you read, you can share the highlights that you've marked on Amazon so other people can say, well, this, this guy reads lots of books, he must be a great guy, or whatever. You know, it's, there's a social purpose. Right? So I would say that every purpose of selling in the future will 
have intersections with social things, right? what's called, of course, social commerce. Right? And it's really always been that way because when you consider that before the internet, we purchased things primarily because of word of mouth. You know, somebody else told us it was good, and so then we bought it. Right? But now, because of the internet, it becomes an extremely viral situation where we, we click and we buy things. Right? So Facebook is working on a scenario, for example, that will surely scare you, called Facebook credits. Uh, it's Facebook money. Right? And many people are arguing that Facebook currency will be more important than the US dollar. Yeah, some people would perceive this as fiction, right? But when you hit the like button on Facebook, I don't know if you've, you've actually done this, but not, nothing much happens. You just like things, you know, it's not, it's not a problem. But when you hit the like button, okay, it is possible, for example, for people to say, well, if I have an account on Facebook and I, I put in five euros a year, every time I hit the like button, if it's a blogger or a film producer or a band or an artist, right, they get a tiny piece of the five euros that I have in my funds, right? And so now newspapers are saying, what, what happens here if people like the newspaper? We give them extra stuff to read on Facebook, right? But they give me a tiny fraction of this like of the five euros per year. But if two billion people do it, right, and 10 cents each, that's, that's, that's interesting. And now you're starting to see people selling on Facebook. Delta Airlines, you can buy tickets from Delta Airlines on Facebook. Right? You don't have to leave Facebook, you buy the ticket there. You can watch Al Jazeera on Facebook. Don't have to go anywhere else. Right? So, I mean, clearly Facebook is becoming a vehicle, sort of a highway for selling. Right? And I would encourage you to investigate this, because uh, if one thing is for sure, Facebook is not going the way of MySpace. Right? Uh, Facebook is is a highway now. Facebook is becoming the next Google and probably better or worse, depends how you look at it. Now IBM says, we're entering the era of social business. Okay. And of course IBM is very interested in this because they have many software tools and suites that they can sell along with this, right? But here's the bottom line, right? If you're an asocial company, if you don't care about your customers, your providers, your, your users, your clients, your business partners, you can't do social business, right? Because basically that, what that means is a disconnect between who you are and what you want to be. And if you're lying in your marketing, like many of us used to do, because basically marketing is not always the reality, right? It's what we want to be the reality, right? It comes out. So Ford in Brazil, I mean, uh, Ford in America, two years ago, launched a Ford Fiesta, which is a small car from Ford, right? And Ford said, how do we do this? How do we get this car out there? Because people don't like small cars in America, like big cars, right? And they used to. Now their gas is too expensive. But anyway, so they went out, they said, you know, here's an idea, this is what the ad agency said. Let's give away 100 Ford Fiestas for free. All you have to do is make a video, one video a month, how you're in the car doing something, talking about the car. Right, that's the only thing. So for, for two years, you have to make one video a month, and we give the car away, you, you can keep it. Right? So you know what the CEO of Ford said? He said, this is a good idea, but you know, what if they say something bad? You know, our car is not that, the car is not so great. You know? I mean, he knew that Ford Fiesta is not a good car, right? So he didn't want to take the risk, but they argued about it for half a year, and they finally said, okay, let's do it. Right? So they gave away 100 cars, they got off 10,000s of videos, but only one single video was bad, even though the car is bad. Right? Of course, you get it for free, which is, makes you more, you know, in armor with this, right? But they gave the customer the control to say, you know, this is really bad, don't buy it, even, or I give it back, it's so bad I would give it back, right? I mean, imagine that disaster for a company like this, right? So what it teaches us that social business has to do with being a, a, a a company that can actually do this. Right? I mean, if you're going to be in e-commerce in this way, I think you have to also consider the implications of it. Right? I think we can safely say, and especially here in Poland, because this is the fast-moving market and you're, you're right in between the boring and stagnating Europeans, right? which is uh, not much is going to happen in Switzerland. <laughs> that really will change the world, I don't think. But in five years, nothing is going to be like it is today. And this is a real challenge, because how can we anticipate this and take advantage of it? I mean, take, for example, Audi. Right? 
Audi is uh, putting money into all kinds of things, including building wind turbines for wind energy that are based on the same technology in the car, but also in, in getting to the apps business. So if you have an Audi A8, you can, the, the car is connected to the internet, right? You can download an app that makes the dashboard look like Batman, you know, it's, it's software, right? So they are an app maker now. They're also investing one-tenth of their money into a self-driving car. A car that drives itself, with, without you driving it, just, you just sit in it. Right? Why would a car company do this? Because clearly they know, A, people will share cars in the future, because cars would get too expensive and it would be too hard to drive them in cities. They know that people will work and live inside the car and work inside the car, so they need apps. Right? They know that in the future, self-driving cars are, are going to be, for sure, everywhere. Right? Because that's, that's quite clear when you look at the facts. So, a bit of planning in the future is to look at the obvious things that are happening and then work our way towards it, because it will be nothing like today. Okay, here's an example. If you're in the business of selling stuff, okay, people invent things that really change how we sell. This is a guy, Dean Kamen, who's an inventor in San Francisco, where I used to live. And Dean invents things every day, okay? But this thing that he has invented is mind-boggling because what it does, uh, it's, it's called the slingshot. And the slingshot creates a thousand liters of water per day from any source of water that you put into it. So it could be, you know, junk water from the factory. It could, it could have, you know, rats in it, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter, right? Not radioactive, but pretty much anything else, okay? It vaporizes the water and makes a thousand liters of clean water a day from any source. Okay, and it uses very little energy. And this is production uh, quality stuff. Now he's gotten twenty million dollars from the X Prize Foundation. And guess who's the company who invested in his thing now? Okay. Take a wild guess. Coca-Cola, right? Coke, okay. because if this takes off. And they're going to put this machine into Africa, and they're going to buy, you know, 500,000 of these machines. Bottled water business is, is toast, huh? Like, why would you need bottled water? I mean, of course, Africans don't buy bottled water anyways, but, you know, they dr drill to find water, right? But, you know, this, this is going to change the way that they do business, right? So, if you look at e-commerce, what are those slingshots, right? What are those things that are going to happen in the next five years? that will radically change how this works, and I think social media is one of those. Right? Uh, social media is clearly going to be the next thing in selling in parentheses, except for the fact that we can't control the social part. It's like going to a dinner party and saying, okay guys, uh, tonight we're going to have dinner together, we're all going to talk about this topic and nothing else. Right? You wouldn't be very popular at the dinner party. Right? This is, that, that is the difference, of course. You can't call the uh, the shots in this way there. So, I think the bottom line is basically we have a couple of simple um, summaries on this topic I want to put forth. So first of all, we're entering what I call the conversation economy. A lot of people want to talk before they buy. This is the great thing about Amazon, right? I mean, Amazon, I, I go there to talk in a way because I'm sharing what I buy. They talk back to me and say, if you buy this and you buy that and so on. It's a conversation. This is the reason why you should be trying Twitter. Right? Because what happens there is you have conversations and they talk about your stuff already. Right? Just go to search.twitter.com, put in the, the product of your company, you'll find out what people are saying. Right? My point would be if you're not in the conversation with your, whether it's B2B or B2C, doesn't matter, if you're not in the conversation, you won't be there at all because they won't care. I mean, I'm not buying anything, I'm not doing any banking, with. I'm not buying airline tickets, I'm not buying a car from a company that doesn't communicate about who they are and what they believe in and what they do. I don't. Right? So EasyJet, you know, goes to Russia, right? EasyJet uh, started flying here and uh, the founder of EasyJet, I've met several times, Stelios, he's the guy with the tankers. Okay, I love EasyJet for what they've done to the airline business, right? But the boarding process, you know, when you go, it's, it's like a bunch of cows being put to the slaughterhouse, right? So I, I, I uh, Twitter about this all the time, you know, I, I try to avoid flying EasyJet, but for that reason, not, not for the flying, right? So I Twitter about this all the time, right? And, and every time I Twitter something, within 10 minutes, 
I have a tweet back from Stelios saying, yeah, you're always saying this, you know, so what is it? Can you show me some photos? And I send photos to Twitter right, to show what's going on in the boarding process. Because once you're on board, people are nice and, you know, it's cool at board, but to get on board is a nightmare, right? So that these guys are having a conversation, and this is why I'm still flying with them, even though I hate the boarding process, right? Because they're trying, right? They're having a conversation. The other thing in commerce that we can see clearly, the successful commerce companies that we see around the world that goes for Zappos in America or eBay or Amazon or many others, right? They're allowing us to have an interaction before a transaction. You know, we can watch a video, we can look at the ratings, we, we can interact, we can actually be comfortable, right? Because I think you said it earlier in your opening speech, right? The, the, the primary driver of business today is trust. Right? It's not the price. I mean, price is very important. Clearly. But I can't tell you how many clients I have that are selling their stuff despite the fact that it's a lot more expensive than the competitors. So it's about trust. I mean, trust is the currency. Right? So when you're looking at multi-channel retailing, you have to say, okay, multi-channel trust. Right? Substitute the word retailing. Right? How do you build trust with people? Well, you have to obviously be more transparent, be more open. Right? Then we have this idea of peer-to-peer -peer sales. Just like we share music online, or, or used to before it became illegal, right? uh, we still do, but no, no argument there. Uh, just like we shared cool movies on YouTube, right? now people are saying to each other, you know, I just bought XYZ. Right? I mean, you've seen the tweets, you've seen the Facebook things, you know, people are talking about what they've purchased. Right? That's, that's better, it can't be any better than that. Right? People recommending things, and we're going to go to an extreme economy of conversation and interaction. So in five years, people won't buy anything unless somebody else has recommended it in some explicit way and endorsed it. So if you're not part of the conversation, you're just not part of anything. You're just not going to be there for the transaction. And that goes for the fact that if you're buying 100,000 kilos of chemicals or whether you're buying a car on eBay. Right? It goes for both. I mean, why is the reason, for example, that in Switzerland, people use Facebook to buy cars? But they don't use eBay. Right? What is the reason? Because when you go on Facebook in Switzerland and you see somebody is selling his car, you can see his profile. That the person is real, right? That's, I mean, Facebook real at least, right? But you can look at his friends, you can see at his latest posts, you can see that he's not a complete idiot or uh, somebody who's going to try to rip you off who lives in, in Shanghai, right? Like you have on eBay. Right? It's somewhat more real, it's more trust. So if you, if you want to sell more stuff, you have to create more trust, as simple as that. That is the first step. More science, what's referred to as big data. You would not believe the amount of data, or you probably would because you're in that business, right? The amount of data that exists about what people do online, right? I mean, this is referred to commonly now as big data. Everywhere we go, we say, yes, we like it, we send a video, we, we sign up, we log in with different things, right? And the social networks have become masters of this, right? Data is the new oil. Right? This is basically, you know, that, that's been said for years. So, but now it's actually true. Because if you can get the data from your customers and they let you use it, right? it's a gold mine for matching them with other things, right? for finding out what they think, for doing R&D, right? for selling them off to other people if they allow it, right? I mean, data becomes the driving factor. Why do you think all the rich companies on the internet, Google's valuation surpasses all of the top five media companies put together? Right? And they don't make anything. What do they do? They take our data. And we give it to them, right? I mean, if you use Gmail, many of you use Gmail, I'm sure it's very popular around the world, they read your email, right? Literally, I mean, people and machines read your email to make those tiny ads. Right? Those ads are so good because they have the entire history of my 400 gig of email right? to give me cool ads. Right? So when I come here and I'm saying I'm coming here to this hotel, it gives me, a, the engine says, you know what, there's a cheaper hotel, it's better, it's very close, and it's, it's, the, it's in my email. Right? So, quite scary, right? but data is the new oil. And basically, whatever data you can get from your users, that is worth giving away stuff for free. I mean, this is the philosophy, of course, of many companies on the internet, Skype, for example, right? 
giving out free stuff. In return, you have the client running, which allows people to have phone calls through your computer. I mean, it's basically what this is what's happening on Skype, right? If we weren't online with the Skype client, the other guys couldn't make the phone call, right? Because it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. So these kind of things are going to happen much more in the future. I think ultimately we're looking at all these things, you know, multi-channel becomes the default, I already said. And this is something that is going to be uh, not news for you, but something we have to face, right? Now, basically, this is the Google paradigm, right? Uh, doing stuff and inventing stuff is puts in a, in a permanent beta phase, right? We're always in a trying phase. And something very un-German to say, you know, is that basically it's speed over perfection. I mean, not when you make airline engines or so, you know, you can't, it has to be perfect, obviously. But this is a very big change that we, we have to invent a lot more stuff. I mean, Google's paradigm is if you're an engineer, you have to spend 20% of your time on inventing something else. Otherwise, you get fired. Right? If you don't take 20% off and come up with ideas that, that lose money, right, you get fired. Right. So, Speed over perfection and, and actually trying stuff is absolutely crucial. Because in this market, in Poland, you know, clearly you can see by the stats I showed earlier, right? it's been slow going for a while, right? but you've reached a, a, a takeoff point now. And the telcos and the ISPs, and I did some work for Play a couple of months ago, clearly they want to wire up every single person in Poland to get on the mobile internet. And it's going to happen. Right? So the question is, will you be ready for that when it does happen? Because at that point, there'll be many other people. You know, essentially, the, the mobile environment is going to really change how we buy and how we exchange information. And basically, the entire world will be on our, in our iris, in our eyes, you know, at any given moment. And this is not bad news. It's great news for people who are selling, except for if they're lying. Okay? I mean, you're going to have to just create more value to attract more customers. I mean, Looking at the mobile B2B revolution, you see here clearly people are all going online and doing data stuff. And this is an understatement from Cisco from last year. You can see people are connecting and doing these things when it becomes so easy. I gave my mother an iPad. Okay? She's 75 years old. Of course, she doesn't know what an Apple is or an iPad, right? or what the internet is for that matter. Right? But she wanted to go on eBay you know, to look for stuff. Right? So, well, you don't have a computer, you can't go on eBay, sorry. Right? So I gave her an iPad. I connected the, uh, to the internet. Now what she does with the iPad, guess what she does with the iPad now? Right? She watches television. She's, she's, she thinks this is the TV. I'm, I'm not joking. Huh? For her, she lies in bed, she watches television on the app that I installed. As long as the internet is working, it's the TV. Right? When things become this easy, this will explode. Right? And when things become cheap, I mean the iPad is vastly expensive. Right? But you know, it only costs $63 to make an iPad. Right? I mean, the guts of the iPad cost $63. Okay? So now there's many devices that will be in the neighborhood of 10 euros. Sounds like science fiction, but just wait. Okay? 10, not, not Apple devices, right? clearly. Yeah, that would be a sacrilege you know, for the 1% who buy the Apple. But in any case, you know, what we're going to see is clearly you know, the move towards businesses making sense with mobile. I mean, 80% of Fortune 500 companies are letting their people use mobile devices to do these things. And I'm not talking about the BlackBerry here. People, uh, businesses use apps to be more productive, to, to reduce paperwork. I mean, this is a trend that we're going to see. If your company hasn't gone on this road, you, you've got to get on there, right? I mean, basically, many people that I work with, they're asking me, well, how do we make this change and say, well, Give your top 20 people an iPhone right? and tell them they have to work only with the iPhone for two weeks. Right? When we find out what life is really like, right? what you can do there. Right? I mean, how can we possibly sell something to people who are our customers, but we don't really know what they're doing? We're living in a parallel reality. Right? I mean, I worked in the music business for a long time, trying to help them to understand digital. Uh, one of my clients, you know, we went to and we discussed how, how kids use music today. Right? And I was dismayed to see they had no, absolutely no idea what people were actually doing. They just said, well, all these kids are just stealing music. You know? Okay, if that's what you think, you're never going to sell anything. Right? Because you haven't bothered to look and say, you can't possibly learn how to swim if you don't get wet. Right? So if you're not doing the same thing, then your customers and your clients are, you're in deep trouble right? because you never really know what it's like. 
This is the reason why you need to be on Facebook and LinkedIn, not because you want to waste time, because it's part of the process. Right? It's exactly like saying, you know, 14 years ago, or what is it, 12 years, when Google started, right? Remember that whole debate about Google? I was in the, in the Silicon Valley back then, and, and we had this debate, and everybody was saying, like, yeah, well, so who cares what kind of ranking you have on Google? You know, people put in my name, and I come on page 15, doesn't matter. Right? A year later, a year later, Every single company in the world wants to pay people to get on top of the first page in the Google ranking. Right? Search, so-called search engine optimization. And I'm sure you know all about this, right? We spent billions of dollars on this. Now it's social engine optimization. Right? It's basically who talks about you, who recommends you, who rates you, who's connected with you. That's what it is, right? There's a, a website called Cloud or Peer Index. If you're not on Twitter, you probably won't know them. But what they do is they take all your API from Twitter, you know, all the information of data from Twitter and Facebook, and they feed it into an engine, an algorithm, that reads how influential you are. It gives, I mean, it's very simple using the API, the open API, right? And it creates a profile saying that GERD has a rating of 62, right? And that means, you know, for some reason they, I don't know how they do this, I think it's basically not, but, you know, anyway, they do this, right? So, in Los Angeles, when you check into a hotel, before you arrive, they'll look you up, they feed you into cloud, and if you have a rating above 50, you get an upgrade to a suite. They upgrade you based on your social rating. I mean, of course, it's typically American stuff. You know? We probably wouldn't do that in Switzerland. But it shows you something, right? There is a new currency, and the currency is how important are you, how many connections do you have, how are you actually dealing with others? And that is a, becoming a social currency. Right? So if you look at all the mobile innovation that we see here, clearly businesses are going mobile, widening the network, connecting employees. Um, I mean, the emerging technologies in the workplace are clearly there. If that's not your company, then you have to have a word with your CEO, right? because that is, that's where you're going to go. What is the time of arrival in Poland of this? I don't know. You guys have to be judging of this. But basically, this, is, this will drive a lot of commercial process, I think. So if you're looking at stuff that many of you may have not heard about, like QR codes, barcodes, markers, GPS, radio frequency chips, all that sort of stuff, right? This mobile-related technology becomes a standard. In Asia, you can go to many places and, and scan the QR code you know, at, at Burger King in, in Tokyo, and it will tell you what's inside the burger. Right, so you hold up the mobile phone, you scan the code, you get information, you decide to kill yourself and eat it, or, or not eat it. Right? I mean, you have this information about local markers, about GPS, and this all sounds like Star Trek to us, right? Like science fiction. Because we, many of us didn't grow up with these tools, right? But for a lot of people, this is becoming a total standard now. And in three to five years, this will be built into any device. So you better get used to that sort of idea of what it does and how it does it. Right? So future of money and transactions, clearly we're going, we're going to lose credit cards, right? I mean, this device, uh, this is called, I think it's called the Square, allows people with an iPhone to take money. And it's widely used already in the US right, as a payment mechanism. But in the future, of course, mobile phones will do that and we'll be able to have mobile payments. I mean, this is clearly going to be a big deal in terms of the, the change of commerce. And it's, it's already quite big here in Poland and being looked at by several big players. So that's something to consider. Now, I think in general, the, uh, the markets that are in transition, clearly you know, I don't know which exact business you're in, but clearly there are some business models that are already quite stressed and other ones that are going to be stressed. So if you're looking at this slide, for example, you can see that Music, news, books, television, movies, they're already quite stressed by the internet. Right? Now we're moving quickly into healthcare, cars, retail, utilities, energy, impacted by the model of, of the internet. The biggest thing that's happening in America right now, for example, for energy, is called the smart grid and distributed energy. It allows people to put solar or whatever windmills out in the garden and contribute to the energy grid. It's the reverse model, so you don't buy energy only from your provider. You also ship it back right? and you can become a provider of energy with, with whatever you've got left over from your solar, for example, if you live in the desert or so. Right? 
So it's a reverse model. So lots of transitions there, and uh, I just want to show you some mobile commerce facts here as well. Uh, clearly what we have now uh, with devices like the iPhone, Android, and many others, right, is that all of a sudden the interface of computers, which was basically expert kind of stuff, you know, geek territory, now it's becoming what we call natural user interfaces, right? You just go like this, right? And now the next thing is you speak. I don't know if you've tried Siri, the, the Apple thing, right? It's very early. But I was in the Google Apps the other day in Australia, and uh, they showed me something where you can, you can speak into, into a device, and basically they, uh, they translate that speech into 20 languages scrolling down the screen perfectly. Right? So not quite speaking yet, but text. And you can sit on your couch and command the television. And the television, of course, is the internet. Right? So you can sit on your couch and you can say, bring up banking, look up balance, send $50 right? with your voice. So these things are, are going to have huge impact. I mean, we're going to be in a store saying to our mobile phone, uh, just hold it up to the barcode and say, save for later. Right? I mean, people are already doing that, but it takes a little bit more effort to do that. That, that is going to be our reality. Uh, we're going to see basically um, the, the reason that people don't uh, buy stuff in a store is that they found online for a better price. I mean, price is a huge issue. Right? As I was saying earlier, Price and trust sort of rank evenly. Right? You buy something that is it's a good deal, you buy it, but if you don't trust them, you wouldn't even buy it for a lower price. Right? And the reverse is also true. If you trust them with the price is too high, you wouldn't buy either. Right? So those things come in with, with parity. So a very important point. So you have things like social networking becoming really important, all this stuff like location-based services. Right? Basically, technology is going to be the major driver of commerce for the next decade. Technology and the cultural changes because of technology. So I always say to my uh, retail clients, you know, you know what, you're now in the content business, right? Because basically, what you're saying, you're distributing content about what you're selling. Right? For example, car companies are now getting heavily into making movies with the cars. Right? Second, you're in the technology business because you have to figure out how what you have can be presented. There's lots and lots of cool technology. Yeah. So, and, and third, of course, you're in the advertising business. I mean, that comes with the territory. Yeah. So, a pilot with an iPad. Right? This is now a standard also. It's actually being discussed whether it should be legal or not, because guess what they do with the iPad when they're up in air? You know, they don't just read the flight manual. Right? But this thing, you know, this, the flight manual used to be 25 kilos or pounds, right? and now it's the iPad. Right? And that changes the behavior of the pilot also because it gets updates on the iPad. In, like every hour there's an update to the flight manual. Right? It's good for us. Makes it much safer for flying, right? supposedly. Here's my friend Karl Lagerfeld. Just kidding. He loves books. Right? We used to be people of the book. I mean, when you think back, you know, I have a library of books, a couple thousand books. Right? We used to love books, but now clearly, you know, we're no longer people of the book, and this is kind of sad, but that's what it is, right? We're now people of the screen. I mean, when you go to, to a big city the next time, especially in Asia, just take a look how many screens the taxi driver has in his front, right? Between four and eight screens are sitting glued to the windshield, right? His Facebook page, his, his taxi thing, right? The GPS and whatever he's got, I mean, it's... Quite mind-boggling. Right? We're people of the screen now. So if you, if you look at kids, you know, between, I would call kids between 15 and 30, right? There's screens everywhere, like absolutely everywhere. Right? And the screen is how we're going to reach them. And when the internet gets faster and cheaper, which is a given, right? That's the goal of every single uh, enterprise in this, in this area, is to make it cheaper and faster right? and ubiquitous. Right? So clearly that's going to happen as a question of when. And, you know, of course, governments are saying basically they know that when 10, when, when 10 of pe more people are connected to the Internet, GDP grows by 1 percent. That's a direct relationship. Not only that, they also know they can save trillions of dollars, for example, from digital education, from voting, from sharing health records, you know, all these things. So governments are connecting people. This is a top priority, clearly. 
So when people get connected, they do these things and that changes radically. You know, people of the screen are going to buy things completely different. And leads me back to one point I made earlier. If you're not yourself a person of the screen, you've got some work to do, right? Because clearly that is where the future is going. So this is an argument I make with many of the CEOs that I talk to, especially if you're between 40 and 75 or so, right? You don't really see a reason to get involved because it's just time wasting, right? But I would propose to you that you have to make time wasting part of your daily job, right? Because if you don't do that, you'll never find out what's at the other end of the wasting, right? which is business. Right? I mean, this is a, is a playground for the business of the future. And Facebook is not a place where kids go and share dates. You know, there's many other places for that now. Right? Facebook is a, is a place where people do a lot of business, right? where they connect and talk about things. So clearly, people of the screen are different. You've, uh, you've noticed now that we all become extremely impatient. Yeah. People call this the nowness. Right? So here's a quick example. Okay, when Whitney Houston died in Beverly Hills in the Beverly Hills Hotel, it took 21 seconds after the room, after the maid discovered Whitney Houston dead. It took 21 seconds for her to be announced to the world as dead through Twitter. Right? It took 41 minutes for the television people to show up. So the speed of what we have today in news and in transactions right, spreads much, much quicker. Right? So you have a choice of being, you know, you're either going to get in with the speed and, and give people the nowness, which also means real-time product results, comparison, you know, or you don't, somebody else will do it. Right? I mean, it's, you really have a very simple choice. You either are part of this disruptive process or you're disrupted. That, that is the choice that you have. I mean, you, there is no other choice really here. So, we now live in a networked society and we're, we have to think about what network business looks like. Eh? And one of the consequences is that we're no longer the only wheel. I mean, if you're looking at this image, it clearly shows you that, yeah, there are big wheels in here, of course, and there may be even bigger ones, right? but they're interconnected. And if one of those wheels drops out, Somebody else takes the place. It's not like Microsoft 15 years ago where you couldn't possibly continue to work if you didn't have the latest update, right? Well, now, you know, if, if something goes wrong and you go somewhere else, you use another tool, right? So, basically, if you look at all the stuff that used to cost money, Google has made it free. You know, email, docs, documents, uh, Android, you know, all that stuff. So. In a network society, that's a really important thing that we're moving from this idea of being central entities, controlling entities, you know, to the idea of being networked. Right? And this is a crucial thing for selling stuff, right? Because when you're on the left in that red dot, you can do whatever you want. People don't have a choice but to buy from you because there's nobody else. I mean, just 10 years ago, if you wanted to watch a movie, or 15 years ago, you have to buy the DVD or you have to fly to London to see it if it wasn't playing in the movie theater here, right? What you do today? Well, you have, you have a thousand options, right? Now, you can pay or not pay, it doesn't matter, right? You, have, you go to movies.to, you can stream for free, and there's a thousand websites that do it for free. Right? So now the option is not too much to say that it's not good to do this, but it's to figure out how you can monetize the, the network system, right? how you can create money out of this. And this is indeed quite a challenge, I think, for content companies. But for selling, basically, you have to realize that control moves to the nodes, you know, the points. Moves away from the center and to the users. So the best thing you can do for retail and for selling stuff is to move control to the user. And when you give the user more control and more tools to, to try to, uh, to basically question you, the more they will like you. I mean, this is what Amazon is doing, right? This is the Clearly, the success behind Amazon is all these things, right? Now, Amazon has, uh, Jeff Bezos has uh, started the Kindle, the, the reading device, right? And basically, nobody asked for this, right? Nobody said, we want an electronic reader. No. But he knew, basically, when he would do this, that in the end, Amazon becomes a publisher. No? Amazon is not just a retailer now. My last book, The Future of Content, is available on Amazon. It took me a week to put it up and it was available for selling. I sold 2,500 in like four hours. Okay. Now that's a big difference to the old system where I got 10% of the profits with a publisher take a year. 
Okay? So those are huge disruptions, I think, that are coming our way here. So uh, if you're looking at uh, BlackBerry being that central, many of you are, are using Blackberries, I think, right? You have to pay for the damn server, right? And there's allegedly, uh, they're more secure. Okay, but now what we have now, yeah, we have Android. You know what? We have a distributed system. We don't need these guys. I mean, we need them for many other reasons because the typing is great, you know, so they're still here, right? I, I'm still a BlackBerry user, right? But we have choices now. In a decentralized system, these people won't survive, right? Because it's all about being, you know, having a closed system. With one big exception, that's of course Apple. Right? They're very good at keeping a closed system. So. I think multi-channel is a total understatement, this idea of multi-channel, because we're moving into a world where the channel thinking is, is probably flawed. I mean, the channel thinking uh, is based on the left, you know, on, on, the, on the tower idea. We have, okay, we used to have two towers, now we've got four towers, now we've got eight towers, right? And we have to control all these towers, right? But really what it is, is this, right? There's hundreds of conversations going on. There's dozens of different ways that people reach us and buy our products. Right? And we have to find a way that we can serve those fragments. Right? We have to think about uh, what Forrester calls here on this slide, a little bit hard to see, right? um, great research report on what's called social commerce. Right? We're entering the era of social commerce. And this has nothing to do with social per se in, the terms, of, you know, uh, in terms of social things, but in terms of the interaction that people do there. Right? So we're moving from a one-to-many to, one to world to a many-to-many many world. I think in your private lives, if there's any such difference, uh, there really is no difference anymore between private and business life, really, for us, uh, as I'm sure you find out, <laughs> I have found out already, right? You're already vastly connected to others. I mean, who's on LinkedIn here? Let's see who's on LinkedIn. Let, let me see some hand signs here. It's okay, you can admit it, okay. All right, why are we on LinkedIn? Because we want to connect to others just in case we need them. Not for jobs, but for connections. Right? So I've got something like 3,700 or so on LinkedIn, and if I want to talk to the CEO of Docomo, it's one email away. Right? Somebody will say, you should talk to Gert. Right? And he will listen. Right? And the same goes for Twitter. I can tweet the chief editor of the New York Times, and he responds. Because what he does, when he gets the tweet, the message, right, he looks at my profile and says, okay, oh, this guy is a complete idiot, I, maybe I should answer. Okay. That's the difference. Okay. Many to many societies. So, so what does this really mean, this sort of funnel? You know, Seth Godin has something very interesting. He's a marketing guy that you should read his books. Um, he's got like, I don't know, 47 books on this. But Seth said basically what's happening because of the internet, you know, we're, we're flipping the funnel. So we're not out here, you know, talking like this to people like broadcasting our message, right? They are out here with their funnel going to me. Right? All we have to do is gather what they're saying to me and then turn that into a process of selling. Right? But that's a, that's a tall order, of course, right? <laughs> because it's reversed. So um, Andreas Weigand, who's a friend of mine, who used to be chief scientist at Amazon, um, he said, in the 90s, it was all about search and find. In the 2000s, it was about social and sharing. And now, this decade is about mobile and creation. And creation in the sense, for example, you know, saying you go somewhere and say, I like this product, I send it off to a friend, upload a video. I mean, the kind of stuff that we have happening now, mobile devices, just beats everything. So we go with this idea from saying, you know, we put a buy now button, uh, we're inverting this idea, right? Essentially saying, okay, there is a way that we have a conversation that leads to a purchase, but we're not telling people that they have to buy all the time, right? It's, it's much more intricate than that. So we're now living in a world to where the users, the consumers, are creating all that stuff themselves. It's called meta content or metadata, right? Uh, we're all in that production cycle. We go somewhere and we say we like this thing or we, we, we forward it to somebody. Right? Basically, content is advertising data and users in the reverse is also true. So if you want to think about selling, you have to think about your customer, uh, whether it's B2B or B2C. That's actually not much of a difference there. So this is what they're doing now. Right? They're generating huge amounts of data that we can use to do a better job. And now, uh, in addition to the people of the screen, we're also people of the cloud. Right? 
When you think about this, you know, all our, our music is moving into the cloud using services like Spotify or Morg or RDO or many, many others, right? Our movies are moving to the cloud with Amazon or iTunes or, right? Our health records are moving to the cloud. And this is the good news for you, right? People's money moved to the cloud. Basically, the way it's going to look like in, in, a, in a couple of years, or pretty much now in many places, right? You can buy anything you want anywhere you are from anyone. That's fantastic news, right? And the only reason you're going to do that is because somebody has recommended it and you actually want it. So advertising will change completely to put people towards a direction that they really like rather than what they could like. So advertising, for example, is changing in the way, and this is bad news for television and for print, right? Because the, the old television was disconnected. It didn't know who I was, thankfully, sometimes. But now every single television that's being delivered, you know, starting, I think, in, in Europe, it's pretty much around now, every single television connects to the Internet. The future of television is the Internet, right? It's the convergence of the two. Right? So all the television guys, Samsung, Sony, everybody else says, one thing you want to do is make sure that the Internet goes online so we can communicate with who's watching. Right? And guess what's going to happen there, right? We'll be able to pull up our slideshow from our kids, you know, or our Flickr images, or Gmail, whatever, right? And the advertising is going to be so targeted, like on the web. Right? Just wait until Facebook offers television, right? We'll be able to watch television from around the world, 10,000 channels on demand for free, using advertising. Anyway, so people of the cloud, you know, clearly that question is, when are you going to get this cloud to work in Poland? I think sooner than you think. Because the benefit of this is, is obvious, you know, no matter how you look at it, this is uh, basically the goal for everyone. So in this world of where we're moving from the idea of, uh, you know, the central entity to, to the network entity, you know, it's basically fundamental changes on how we live and work, community, communi uh, communicate and buy and sell. Right? I mean, these are fundamental changes, so I would urge you not to look at retailing, multi-channel retail in a way of saying you're going to put on a, a, a but a mousetrap, right? Or put a fig leaf on, or a band-aid, right? I mean, some of those is needed, right? But let's think a little bit larger. Right? E-commerce of the future, and the, the super challenge is this, right? Point number one, we're going from e-business to me-business to we-business. This is a great simplification, of course, right? It's not enough to go to people and say, you know what, now you can buy this. Well, that's great news, okay? That, that was great news in the 90s. You know, I, I can go somewhere and click, okay? But then it was about my stuff, and now it's about our stuff. And in other words, that's, you know, the, the social commerce parts I talked about earlier. Right? So there's a great opportunity there. Mercedes-Benz has already discovered this, that they have this site called uh, Generation Benz. If you're a Mercedes driver and they like you and you've bought lots of cars from them, they will invite you to come to this website and you can contribute to the R&D of the next Mercedes. There's 750,000 people in this, right? Drivers. And you can tell them what they should build. It's free, of course, right? You don't, you don't pay, but they don't pay you either, right? Most of their R&D for the luxury cars comes from this place, right? It's ideas of the drivers, right? I mean, they're engaging people. You know, I think we have to rethink how we do business when it's from the me to the we. How does that impact what we're selling? This is what Daimler does about the open innovation network. I would say, you know, we're now dealing with the people formerly known as consumers. In fact, I think we should strike that word. Right? I mean, if I said to you guys, you are just consumers like you were 15 years ago, you wouldn't be happy with that because it's like saying, you know, you're just a white guy or something, right? Okay, that's true, but that's not, all, not, that's not all I am, right? There's more to it, but we have to think about these people becoming different kinds of people, different kinds of uh, pieces of them, right? And if, if you're looking at this, you know, basically, if we talk about multi-channel, I think consumers already have multi-channel lives. Maybe many of us don't have that because we're not, you know, maybe we don't really feel like we should be part of this, but we have multi-channel lives, television, mobile phone, email, internet, and so on. Right? So, 
a, a stat here from uh, some recent research from the ITU in Poland, right, showing you that definitely you have some work to do. You need to talk to your government and get them to hurry up to put people online. This is a, a crucial re requirement. I look, the second one here is Poland. You guys have mostly DSL and a few other things, but not like the other com uh, countries where you have several options. And this slide shows you basically that a lot of people in Poland have said the reason that they're not online is because there's no need. I mean, this research is, I think, from 2008, right? So I'm sure it has changed, right? ITU isn't that fast with research, right? So I think you're at the takeoff point now, a bit of a pivot point, where all these old concerns are starting to go away. And hopefully the government will also support this. I just wanted to show you this slide here by a friend of mine, Ross Dawson, who's a futurist from Australia. And he talked a lot about the news and media business, right? And if you're looking at this slide, this is your future, even though it's about newspapers, right? Basically what's happening is that people in the news business have said, you know, people should be willing to pay for content and pay for news, well, which is a logical assumption if you, if you make the content, right? But the bottom line is that people consume news because of 50 different reasons, right? That they value. They value the filtering, the curation, the packaging, the community, the relevance, the timeliness, the novelty. These are all issues why I, why I buy stuff, right? That's why I read the Wall Street Journal or so or not because of this mix of things. Okay. If you take this map of the newscape and you superimpose it over what you're doing, which is retail, selling things, right, then you can clearly say that people are going to buy stuff because of a myriad of reasons, many different reasons. You know, your job is to create a value map that is meaningful for them. So they may buy something because it's easy. They may buy something because it looks good. Like, you know, for example, buying apps on the mobile phone. You guys, if you have an iPhone or an Android, you know it's so easy. Somebody comes up with, a, with an app for the weather or so. It's one euro, you, you click and that's it, right? It's easy, it's low price, it doesn't really matter. So the average iPhone user spends $4.80 a month, right? On this stuff that's kind of like, it's a combination of all these things. And then you forget that you even have these apps, right? You buy it, you use it once, never go back. I mean, what a great business. Apple sells more apps than it sells music and, and movies combined, right, money-wise. So clearly there's a value creation here that we have to say, well, the bottom line is here that if we use this as a roadmap, we have to add value. And I think the fragmentation is also quite clear that many different customers have different reasons to buy. They don't all have the same reason. Some are more for money, for price than others. The bottom line everywhere is this, right? It's control to the user. And of course, this is the most painful part because we, we really don't like this idea. I mean, if, if we're going to give the user so much control that they can kick our butts all the time, that, that's not a good position to be in. Right? For example, the airlines, many airlines did not until EasyJet came along and EasyJet allowed people to rebook online, right? To see the availability of flights and, and rebook and do all completely transparent. And they charge for it, of course, right? but you can do it. All of the big airlines around the world did not want us to have this kind of power, right? Because A, it was a travel agent who could do it, you have to protect them, right? and B, they don't want to tell us what's available, right? because we can compare. Now all the cheap airlines have done this, now Swiss and Lufthansa finally, three months ago, said, okay, you can rebook online. I mean, why? why? Why does somebody else have to come along and destroy your business so that you're going to make a change? I mean, it makes no, makes no sense, right? So the more you can empower your customer, the better. And that goes also for your B2B relationships, right? So you should do those, make those moves now because, as I, as I said earlier, I know this is all about, all about trust. Rupert Murdoch's story, you all heard about this, of course, right? Basically, uh, he had to apologize to the public, you know, I don't know, 500 times over the last couple of weeks. Uh, but transparency is now becoming something that people are expecting from you, right? You made a mistake, you have to be able to admit it, right? Something goes wrong, you have to talk about it. Right? You can't do something, you have to tell people. Right? I call this the tyranny of transparency. I, it really is a bit of a tyranny, but there's nothing we can do about it. Right? If you're selling stuff online, if you're a retailer, you have to be transparent with all of the pieces. For example, Unilever, one of the biggest brands in the world, having owning something like 5,000 consumer goods, right? We did a seminar the other day, and it's quite clear, you know, they're spending something like $50 billion buying stuff. You know, the procurement people buy, 
you know, soap or palm oil, like, you know, a million pounds of palm oil or something, right? right? So all of a sudden, these companies are subject now to transparency because people are saying, you know what, if you buy this much stuff, maybe you should buy, buy it from organic farmers or from farmers who are not cutting off all the trees, right? So all of a sudden, they're responsible for that too. They're not just responsible for the cheapest price, but now they're also responsible for the Amazon. Right? So that transparency is our future. And you can say you don't like it, but yeah. look at the music business. I mean, they did not survive this 75% profit decline in, in a decade. Right? So here's a video that you may have seen. A FedEx delivery guy, just from last week, pulls up doesn't ring the doorbell, he just throws the delivery, which is a computer screen, over the fence and takes off. Right? And he was filmed by the security camera. Huh? So this guy put the video on YouTube and within 13 minutes got 8 million views. Right? <laughs> and the stock went down of FedEx. And they had to explain that this guy was a bad driver, but not everybody does this. I mean, it's obvious not everybody does this, right? But I mean, of course, we all know this guy is probably an idiot. You know, he just did it for that reason, you know, or he was just stoned or whatever. But, you know, basically what we're seeing here is that this transparency is, is expected from us all now. Before people have a meeting with you, right, if you're running any company of any significance, right, they go and check you out online. So if you don't have a name like Gary Smith, you know, which is difficult to find, right, people go to your LinkedIn profile and they check you out. Right? I mean, I'm sure it happens to you all the time now, right? And if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, if you're not on Facebook, if you're not listed on the company website, right, they're going to say, who is this person doesn't exist? I'm meeting a ghost. Right? I mean, this is basically, that is what, I mean, we're living in a public world now, right? So in many ways, our privacy has been supplanted with what I call publicity, right? You know, if you're in business, you're public. And that creates, of course, all kinds of problems, right? But Transparency, I mean, here you can see the police department in Davis, California at a peaceful demonstration from Occupy Wall Street demonstration where the, uh, the policeman steps up and, and uh, without, like a, like a priest in the church, pulls out the pepper spray. Right? Uh, in this kind of, I mean, you see videos like this every single day. Right? Last year there were 56 laws or new laws were overturned because of Facebook action. People got together and said, we don't want this law. Let's all talk about it, right? And it didn't happen. So you can assume that people are really going to look at what you do. Transparency is crucial. Uh, as the CEO of Salesforce.com, which is a fantastic service, I'm sure that many of you are using it, right? He says it's not about the Arab Spring only, it's about the corporate spring. I mean, the, the power has shifted to our users, our suppliers, our partners, and of course the consumer. Right? And the major force of that power shift is that people want stuff for free. I'm sure you've, you've recognized this here. As consumers, we love free. Like a, the you know, phone company gives us you know, a thousand SMS, we buy from them because it's free, right? Or their bundle music, we buy from them, right? We like free stuff. Now, on the internet, this has become the paradigm of operations, right? You're getting something because you're going to buy something else, right? That's not new, but on the web, this has extreme consequences. For example, Amazon has just launched a movie service in America. And to launch the movie service, they didn't say, we have movies now, click here to buy. They said to every single user, that's a premium user, you know, getting free shipping, you can watch 5,000 movies online for free. It's a present. So Amazon went to the movie studio, said, we're planning this. How much would you charge us to get 5,000 movies from you guys? So we can build this together, right? They paid whatever, 30, 40 million something like that, right? And they gave a gift to the customers. Right? Now the customers are saying, wow, 5,000 movies, that's pretty cool. I'll, I'll watch 5,000 movies, you know, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> but, so they get into this, they do this, and before you know it, they say, oh, you know, it's quite cool, but I wish I would have the archive and watch those old movies from Truffaut or whatever I want to watch, right? Then they pay, right? That's called freemium, right? Free and premium, right? And that is the operating paradigm of modern commerce. If you can figure out how to give away something for free that will not cost you too much or nothing, right, and then unlock the next level, right, then you found the holy cow. 
So I would encourage you to think about how can you make something free and then convert 50 to 80% of the free users to the next level. Right? LinkedIn works the same way. Right? You can use LinkedIn for free, but if you want to sell more, send more emails, it's 20 bucks. Last year they made $650 million. Right? And this doesn't cost them anything because the flag that says you can send, you know, the database flag says, okay to send, right? That's it, doesn't cost anything. So freemium is a great model I would encourage you to look at. There's lots of examples on this which you don't really have time to get into, but uh, we're looking at Evernote, for example, or Dropbox, or, or LinkedIn, you know, many of those things, and, and Amazon, right? This is the Amazon ad. So if you can think of making something free, I think multi-channel retailing, this would be the holy grail. Right? If you do this, we'll give you this, and if you do that, we can sell you this, right? It's basically that sort of idea, right? a connected idea. This is the ideal vehicle for multi-channel multi selling, right? because you can make something free and something else costs money. And look at the telecom companies, the ISPs and operators, that's what they're doing. It's, it's called bundling, right? So if you buy the DSL, then you also get movies. You know? So think about it like this. I think it would be a very fruitful conversation to think about what you can make free. This is Facebook, of course. And by the way, I'm not a great Facebook promoter. I just use it as an example. I think Facebook is becoming infrastructure. There were many other good companies like Facebook doing very similar things, including, of course, the Polish company. Can't pronounce it, but what is it called? Uh, Nazga Klasa. Yeah. Okay, so interesting to see that they're basically now evening out. Right? But clearly, I mean, if so many people are using both, right? social networks are the next cable TV. Right? I mean, they're basically places where people swap information. And we are, the, we are the content of Facebook. So many people have said, sort of with, with humor, that Facebook is like a full-time virtual reality show. You know, and, and we are the actors. Right? We're acting on Facebook and people can watch us. That's sort of like Big Brother or something. Right? So that's not too far-fetched because now that big brands, you know, there's almost every single major brand is going on Facebook and creating a channel there where they have videos and audio podcasts and pictures of the executives and updates and conversations and, you know, it's a lot like interactive TV. So basically what's happening there is that we can easily say, well, Facebook is becoming like television and CRM is a social tool. Right? I mean, Facebook is CRM. If you haven't noticed, right, social media is CRM. So uh, that is clearly going to be the trend in the next couple of years. You know, we're heading into uh, a world of what's called lycanomics. And it's, a, it's a book by Rohit Bhagava, who is, uh, Bhagava, who's publishing it very soon. It's a friend of mine. The like button is worth the more than advertising. Okay. Likeonomics means, and this is really, really true in, B, in B2B, right? It's even more true in B2B. Why would you do business with somebody that you don't like in parenthesis, right? You're worried about them, they may be dangerous, they may not be honest, they may have been tainted by bankruptcy or whatever it is, you know. You don't do business with people you don't like. And that is going to get worse, or, or better, you could say, because of the internet, right? Because we're becoming more transparent. You can make mistakes, but you have to say that you made them. Uh, within reason, of course, right? So I think this is a crucial trend like economics that we're going to see on, on a global level. Uh, they will become absolutely crucial in the B2B sector. The only value that you have is trust and being liked and offering added values. Everything else is just coming down to the common race towards zero, which is free, right? You make everything free, people will buy from you, right? So that's basically what it comes down to. Uh, I'm gonna skip the LinkedIn stuff because we don't have enough time, but sorry about this. Uh, one important slide here is this one. You've heard about earned media, hopefully. Earned media is essentially the idea of saying, you know, when people talk about what, what we are and what we do and how good we are, we earn attention, we don't pay for it. And this is the trend that we're seeing basically as, as a way of marketing. I'm not talking about better mousetrap here, I'm talking about honest earner marketing. You see, the owned stuff, the bought stuff, and the earned stuff. Now there are people saying that our marketing is going to shift to 50% of our marketing is going to come from earned media. People talking about us. And this is why you would give away stuff for free. Right? And I have to warn you, of course, there's one thing that kind of spoils the party here, right? Uh, when we buy marketing, we control it. 
Right? When we earn marketing, we get more reach, but we have no control. Right? And this is precisely why a lot of CFOs and CEOs are saying, I don't like this idea. They could talk bad about my product because yeah, my product is not so good. Yeah? Okay. That's the trade-off. Right? You can't have the cake and eat it. Right? You want people to talk about your stuff, you have to let them talk what they want to talk about. Dell computers, great example. You may remember about 10 years ago or 12 years ago, uh, Dell was really big, and then Dell machines got really bad, and they went to this thing called Dell Hell, right? where everybody was bitching about Dell. You know, nobody was buying anymore. So Michael Dell said, what we do here is we go online and we just pull down our pants and say, okay, We've got these problems, let us know what they are. And they started this huge conversation right, called the idea storm. And they have 27 people on Twitter doing nothing but taking customer complaints. Right? And they improved the product, but guess what? The Dell computers have improved, but they're not that much better than before. right? But they're okay again, people buy them again. right? Because people have taken the conversation inside. Right? They've, they've earned this, right? even though they have not actually fixed every single piece. Right? So you don't have to be Superman then, but you do have to take in the, the conversation. Significant challenge, you know, we, we, we all have to become a little bit more like Google uh, in the sense that we would expect somebody else to invent something that's going to be completely disruptive. And in, in, a, in a way you could say that Google has already been completely disrupted themselves, right? By the likes of Facebook and Twitter. Right? Because Google was all about saying, you type something in, you find it, and we own that, right? But now, guess what people do now? They go on Facebook and listen to what people are saying. Right? That's, a, that's a real problem for Google, because it's not algorithms in the same way. Right? So a little piece of the Google uh, empire is to say, well, how can we accept that we live in a world that's constantly moving? Then we can't always look for a plan. I mean, we can look for a plan, but we can't take a year to make the plan and another year to roll out the trial. Right? It has to be permanent beta, so we put 10,000 euros into an idea, we launch it, it fails, we do the next one. Not, not a million euros, right? We have to try stuff more, much, more, you know, much more quickly. So Google, for example, has 1,200 alpha projects, which are invented by the Google staff, and then they graduate into beta. They have 150 beta projects, and the last one, Google Mail, just came out of beta. Right? That's their process. You've got to have a process like this. Remember what I said earlier, I think when you're in the selling business, right, it's about technology, right? it's about advertising, and it's about content. So you have to actually invest in this stuff. So I'll give you a quick summary and then we have some questions. First, <clears throat> I didn't talk much about this because it's kind of obvious. The future of selling anything is social, local, mobile, video, cloud. Right? It's all these pieces. People want to see videos about your products. They want to see your stuff in the cloud. They want to be able to do it on the mobile. There are estimates saying that from uh, we're going to see in some countries, probably will take a little bit longer and more than others, um, we'll see the entire internet traffic will move to 80% on mobile devices. Okay. So completely the reverse of today, which is mostly computers, right, which are not made for buying right, or content, right, they're made for work. Right. So when the internet moves to mobile devices, when people use mobile devices, they become your perfect buying partner, right? But that's, that's a different world. I think that we have to get used to that is the future. If you don't live in this world, you don't know what social means, you don't have a mobile phone that can go online, uh, you don't know, you don't watch videos, you know, and of course you're not in, in the same world than the user. And I'm not talking about kids here, I'm talking about literally the biggest growth in social networking is 32 to 50 years old. And of course those are the clients and customers. Data is the new oil. You're collecting data, but you're not using it, or you're not filtering it, you're not mining it, or you're making mi mistakes with data, right? Like privacy violations and those kind of things, right? But I can't understand, for example, why we still have these debates in many e-commerce companies, why you don't allow people to log in with Facebook into your website, right? I mean, I'm sure you have this debate all the time, right? People want to buy something, you make them register. Why? Log in with Facebook. Log in with Twitter, called the social login. Okay, you don't get the user data in the beginning. You get it later. Right? Simple as that. But you lose 90% when you require them to sign up with something where they're not already signed in. Right? 
It's the same thinking than the music business where they said, okay, if we can control the artists, the distribution, the copying, the, uh, the royalties, you know, then we're, we're, we're in great shape, right? False. Complete failure, 75% decline of revenues in a decade, right? Because the reverse is true, right? So, anyway, it's not about that, so it's about finding a new way of doing this. Uh, interaction before transaction. You want to sell lots of stuff, then you have to engage. If you don't engage, you won't sell. You may sell now because there's nobody else selling it, right? but that's going to stop. Right? I mean, Amazon is, is a social place as much as it is a store. And any, any good store, of course, even an offline store is a social place. Right? I mean, that, that's, of course, the logic of selling. Return on involvement, not return on investment. This is a nightmare for CFOs. But you have to get involved, and then you have to invest, and then you have to figure out how to make this work. i put this again there, sorry. The conversation economy. This always sounds a little bit like, you know, sort of uh, 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 California geek stuff, right? But it's not. I mean, every conversation can have multiple purposes, right? But when you're having a conversation with your client or your business partners, it always results in building more trust, and that results in more transactions, right? It's as simple as that. But you're not having a conversation about the transaction every time. Right? I mean, that, that wouldn't be human in that sense. Right? So, multi-channel is the new default. I mean, clearly that depends on the exact time of when the rollout of, of uh, connectivity is improved. Right? Give control to your customers. Of course, we've said that for 50 years. Right? But now the reality is that right, people having these devices, right, they have control. If you refuse, they'll just annihilate you. If you give them as much control as you can, and look at what's happening with the airlines, right? I mean, all this stuff, I can go to Swiss.com and I can see how much carbon I've burned now using a graphic, right? And, and in fact, now the airlines are starting to suggest that I shouldn't fly. Right? I mean, this is the next step, if you think this through, right? So airlines are now looking at building places and airports where you can virtually travel, right? Telepresence, 3D holographics, right? Those things cost a million euros. Next time you go to the airport, the airline will say, you know what, we figured out that if you only go in there to speak for half an hour, go in this box. We'll ship you there. And don't burn any carbon. So those kind of things are the future. Control to your customers. I want to thank you very much for your time.